We might be live. I guess there's only one way to find out. Boom. We are live. Okay. So this is happening right now. And if we change it to be this, then what you're seeing is this. AKA the stream. There's a better way to do this, of course, but for now, you know what? It's fine. Okay, so welcome. Welcome, everybody. It's interesting. Um, I guess I should, should do this. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay, great. Uh, actually, let me do one more thing. Let's post this on Twitter. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Mm -hmm. From watching all the Twitch streamers, I can... I know what this is like where you kind of go there they type stuff in they post on Twitter they say we're live over here so I can do that uh, we're live uh, testing experimental live stream I are look ma I'm a titch streamer <laughs> on YouTube <laughs> Okay, fuck it. We're doing it. We're clicking the tweet button. I think that that should work. Like, isn't this just the live stream? It should be the live stream. Um. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's going. Okay, great. So here's the dealio, people. Um. I. This is. I've done a couple of these in the past, but the goal here is to, this is another episode of both the re-show and also an experimental live version of the re-show, where I will actually, let me check, I want to make sure I have chat up, <laughs> you know, you gotta have chat, uh, so let me get chat here, live chat, uh, pop out chat, beautiful, uh, so... Yeah, the, um, and let's put this, yeah, let's put this over, let's put it somewhere, <laughs> I guess I can just check it occasionally by pulling it over, let's delete, 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 okay, um, and then let's pull this over. Um, actually, no, I want to be on top just in case anybody chats. So let's do one more thing, which is to pop this, make this a little bit smaller, just so we can see chat. It would be good to pull up chat on my phone, but I'm not pro enough for that quite yet. Okay. Um chat will be on the side over here and I will be able to see you okay so the goal of this video is to this is episode 86 of the reshow and it is also an experimental version of this where I talk directly to you the viewers and listeners and so yeah this is an experiment I think it's going to be posted as a podcast and also 
is being live streamed, you know, straight to Twitter and straight to the YouTube. And the goal here is essentially to, you know, some folks that I know do these kind of weekly updates of what they're thinking about and what they're doing in the world and, or, or how they're kind of sense making about the world. And so instead of just doing, you know, weekly blog posts or something like that, I wanted to experiment with spoken word because it is to some extent my more natural state. And so the goal here will be to discuss, you know, uh, the current state of information and things that are happening in the world uh, in order to help you understand and make sense of things and the macro goals to say, hey, here's a beautiful future that we're going towards and let's try to make it happen. So today we're going to chat about a couple different things. We're going to chat about uh, a little bit about the... Uh, some books, starting with Where Is My Flying Car and this concept of poverty levels. Um, then we'll move on to cultural progress studies, which is a term that's being thrown around these days based off of an Astral Codex 10 paper. Um, and then we're also going to chat a little bit about uh, some of the books I'm reading um, around how the brain works and also uh, the future of religion. And then finally, we'll chat a little bit about uh, information niches in the world. And all of this in general, the goal for me, for you and for me, is to kind of, we're gesturing towards a book that I'm currently writing called What Information Wants. And so hopefully this will all be kind of centered around this idea of thinking of information as a being in and of itself, as a replicator, and how that replicator is currently mm, uh, traversing our current information landscape. Okay, with that as a framing, let's dive in. And if you want to ask any questions or Q&A as it's going down, feel free to just say hi in the chat. I don't know if anybody's actually here, but hi, it's Reese. Um, so let me know if you're here. Uh, so here's the, let's just start with this first one. And I'm going to be moving back and forth a bit as well between just pure speaking, but also showing uh, some slides not some slides, but, you know, internet stuff, uh, things from Google Chrome pages. So let's start with that computer and camera. Okay. So let's start with this Roots of Progress piece. So there's a book that folks like called Where's My Flying Car by Jay Stores Hall, who is a person from, let me make sure this is just working. Yes, it is. Okay, great. Um, and so Jay Stores Hall is a Foresight Institute person uh, who's worked a lot in nanotechnology. And his this is a book, just like a classic progress studies book where it's saying, hey, we can do so much better in the world. Let's do it. And this book, uh, so I've read a couple of the book reviews of it, and this is a great book review by Roots of Progress. And, you know, Jason's been doing a bunch of these great book reviews recently. And I think the key thing that I want to hone in on here is like the macro overview of the book is that uh, hey, let's have flying cars, let's have nanotechnology, and let's, you know, and a big theme is like nuclear power, uh, which is actually pretty great. There's this great Henry Adams curve, the Adams curve, which shows that essentially energy per, energy consumption per capita has been doubling every century um, since the 1800s, essentially industrial revolution, oh my god, look at all this energy, um, but then it started to flat line, flat line right around 1970. Uh, trigger, <laughs> WTF happened in 1971, uh, web page. And this uh, this is kind of a concerning line. I mean, we do want to keep increasing our energy use in a way that is in accordance with the environment. And so, yeah, and so, you know, the sadness of this is that, hey, man, like, that's really sad. And especially it's sad because this classic um, nuclear uh, graph of like, hey, it used to be $1,000 per kilowatt hour to... Um, make nuclear plants but then 1980 is after chernobyl they started to go up to five thousand or ten thousand dollars per kilowatt hour and so that said we have this great untapped energy source that we're trying to use and this is all gesturing towards like hey we could be doing so much better as a society we've kind of become complacent we've we're stagnating you know it's like dream bigger and i agree with that to some extent and i think that you know the clear most clear thesis or statement of that is right here, which says, um, you know, Hall is, uh, you know, pulling from Hans Rosling's book, Factfulness, and Hans Rosling's data, which states, look, that there are these four different income levels um, that we can break society into. It's not just extreme poverty and non-extreme poverty. And 
uh, to show you what that looks like. Here's my uh, book review of that piece. And so usually we think of society like this, you know, where it's like, oh my God, look at all these developing countries. They have so many babies per woman. They have no one, no the children survive to the age of five. That's so sad. But actually that graph is from 1965. And here's what the graph actually looks like. Um, we're much closer to lots of, you know, developed and developing may have made sense, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but it doesn't make as much sense today. And what we should instead use today is these income levels. And so these say, hey, if you're under $2 a day, that's extreme poverty. If you're between 2 and 8, you're level 2. If you're between 3 and or 8 and 32, you're level 3. And if you're level 4 plus, uh, or if you're $32 per day or more, aka $15,000 a year or more, then you're at uh, level 4. And so these levels are a really helpful way to think about where society's at. And here's the, like, in terms of billions of people, here's how many billions of people are at each of these different levels. Um, and so we have essentially a, you know, a billion folks at level four, a billion folks at level one, and then a lot of folks, everybody else, five or six billion at level two or level three. And so that is, you know, it, what it allows to, it takes this graph of, you know, world population, extreme poverty, and says, okay, let's add a little bit more texture here, and instead it can turn it into this graph, which shows that um, there is there are these different levels, that we have different amounts of people, um, and we want to essentially move people up from level one to level two, level three to level four. And so that is how these levels work, and what, um, back to the hall piece, you know, where is my flying car, he's saying, look, oh man, we can state the great stagnation story is simply there is no level five and that's a good that's a very powerful story it's like hey why don't we have folks who are above you know if you think about you know going bigger than level five like level four is only fifteen thousand dollars a year roughly so it's like can't can't we get so much better than this like what you know like isn't there something where everybody has a flying car and has nanotechnology and blah blah um and I think that that's a pretty, you know, powerful statement. But I disagree with um, I disagree with the articulation to some extent. And here's the crucial thing: when we what we're trying to optimize for as society is happiness. And remember that happiness is log income. And so here's this, you know, the graph of life satisfaction and income. And essentially, you double it a bunch to go up. Every doubling gets you like an additional 0.5 happiness, roughly, um, of income. But right around at $45,000 per year, you just get a flat line. Um, you know, here's here's a graph of individual income, and boom, it just like flattens out right at $45,000 a year. And so the, what that means is that instead we should think about level five folks as folks who have – there's everything pre-level five, and then there's level five. You know, level five folks are folks who have kind of gotten enough to be happy, you know, um, while level one through four are folks that are still more money makes them happier. Well, after you get to level five, after $120 a day, aka $45,000 a year, boom, you've reached that abundance mode. And so I think that we already do have a level five in society, um, that's where I would disagree with Hall, um, and that that level five is a level five where with folks like me and many other folks, you know, tech developers and lawyers and all those people who are actually above, um, who are, uh, who are at this point where they have enough money to, uh, where more money doesn't make them happier. So I think that that's how we should think about level five, um, and that those level five folks should obviously self-tax themselves to, um, give to level one and get level, get everybody to move up all the levels that we get everybody at level five. And I also think, you know, maybe I would agree with Hall to say that there is something like a level six that might exist, which would be, I'm not sure the best way to say level six, but it is, you know, maybe you could call like breaking the, uh, log income barrier or something where people are, where we find a way to really double, uh, you know, once you go from $120 a day to, you know, 480 or $500 a day, that you really actually can get happier after that point. But I think that that's kind of, it's a win more strategy. Like once we've gotten there, we've already gotten there. Um, and the things that are more important are 
getting everybody to level five, doing that as a way to ensure the sustainability of the human species and, and long-termism and things like that. And then we can start to think about kind of level six stuff. But I think the most important thing is for level fivers, A, that they already exist, and B, that they um, should self-tax themselves to help other folks get to level five. So I disagree. Uh, I love the framing of, you know, thinking about level five. And I think that level five already exists. Um, yeah, I think it already exists. And I think that, yes, we want nuclear energy and all these things to help more people get up to level five. But level five is kind of the end game. Um, it's not the end game, end game, of course, but it is the next forced move that society needs to make uh, right now is get everybody level five. And then we can work on the kind of long term sustainability things of the human race co-evolving with nature and machines okay so that's kind of the first big thing that i want to say let's transition to number two here which is yeah yeah these um thinking about you know there's this astral codex 10 piece recently called the rise and fall of online culture uh or the rise and that was that the name of it uh the rise and fall of online culture wars yep and it's all about, you know, in kind of classic scholar, Alexander speak, you know, he's, he's evaluating social justice activism, especially, and, and looking at how, but, but also all these different mimetic tribes, and trying to understand how culture is kind of, is spreading through society. Um, and he's kind of worried about, you know, the social justice activists um, becoming too sensory and stuff like that. And so that is the rough overview of the piece. I think it's a great, uh, I would categorize it. I wish there was a term for this, but there's, you know, a great piece called uh, Mimetic. Uh, it's called, it's by Peter Lindbergh. It's from 2018 called like Mimetic Tribes 2.0, I think is probably the name, um, which again, is it looks at a bunch of these different groups that are happening, social justice activists, techno-utopians, you know, the future of meaning and stuff, and how they're kind of battling for attention in our new world. And so, what would I say here? I think that the, um, yeah, so, so I guess the crucial piece is just to kind of, yeah, let's situate you. So, I think that the, uh, I think that the great question, uh, which Scott asks is at the end of his piece, he says, what is the cultural change equivalent of progress studies and what might we be able to do if we had it? I'll restate that. What's the cultural change equivalent of progress studies and what might we be able to do if we had it? That's a really good question. And I think that it is because progress studies is this idea that says, okay, we have technological innovation and how we know that it happens in S curves, but how can we ensure that those S curves, those sigmoids continue into the future and that we can continue increasing, you know, per capita energy and per capita blah, 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 so that we get everybody in the world can be happy because many more people are happy now as a result of the industrial revolution. That's kind of the, the steel man of that claim. And the, and so we can ask a similar question, but instead of for technological innovation, we say, okay, what, how does culture itself change? And how can we see these patterns from past cultural change in order to understand our current cultural change and to shape it positively? And that's a good question. And I think that, you know, my answer to that would be that would be a kind of a mimetic answer which would be to say that, in fact, both technological innovation and cultural innovation are manifestations of memes, that they are these ideas that can spread from mind to mind. They are these replicators. Those replicators can both live in human brains. They can live in informational substrates like books or the internet, and they can live in technological artifacts like tools or factories and those memes want to replicate in the same way that genes want to replicate because the non-replicators die out and so we're only left with things like me too or black lives matter or maga that are very very good at replicating 
or things like, you know, proselytizing religions and all kinds of stuff. Um, and so, this is to say that my claim would be that the cultural change equivalent of progress studies is actually a wrongly formed question that there is, or rather, you could say that they, yeah, they're both part of this underlying thing, which is mimetic evolution. And I think that's a very important question. And this is the question of what information wants and how information flows, how it shows up as technology, how it shows up as um, as information, you know, in, in, our, in our brains or whatever. <laughs> and I think that, I, I guess I want to point to some of these, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a really difficult question. I think that Part of part one to answering this question is, yeah, there's a lot of different threads to go on here. One of them is that we want to, uh, we need to differentiate, just like I did uh, a minute ago, between the different kinds of information and how they replicate. And so this is differentiating technology from just like, you know, uh, information as stored in brains this is once we get to the information stored in brains then we want to differentiate between the different kinds of memes that can exist and so as a simple example this is something like uh, you know i i would break this into kind of three categories there's virals there's myths and there's knowledge virals are things that are are kinds of information that are naturally uh fit for our brains, but are really good at just replicating and don't have good long-term uh, abilities. And so this is something like a catchy song, right? Catchy songs or other memes on the internet, like the Bernie Mittens meme, they only, they spread really fast and then they go away really fast because they're optimized for uh, transmission and acquisition and not uh, retention. And so that is, so there are virals. There are also there's knowledge, and knowledge is uh, stuff like two plus two equals four, or gravity falls at nine point eight meters per second, or the steam engine works like this. And knowledge is powerful because it uh, gets into the infrastructure in a powerful way because it can meet human needs. When we think about what information wants, it both just wants to replicate like virals do, but it also wants to meet human need because then humans will be excited by it um, and will spread it. And so something like Newton's theory of gravity was helpful for creating technology which made more humans and made humans happier and so it spread. And so knowledge as a thing can spread. And so that's kind of another type of... And, and it's also, I would say, <laughs> uh, it is a fit form of information because the information in the physical ecosystem is puzzle pieced with it and that may have been confusing but what i mean by that is there is a uh if you're trying to make the claim that you know something falls at 9.8 meters per second squared that is easy to spread because it is shown physically in our world a lot we can see objects falling from gravity a lot and so we can make some kind of blanket claim like that and that informational claim that meme that little equation is fit for the world the world as it exists our universe of all the you know parallel universes or whatever is one in which 9.8 meters per second squared is true and so it's good for just like other memes are fit to exist in our brain in like a catchy song way so too is knowledge fit for our physical world um, and then the third kind of, uh, meme is myths. And in fact, what I would say is that, you know, Scott's question here of what is the cultural change equivalent of progress studies, he's mostly just talking about myths. He's not really talking about virals. He's not really talking about knowledge. He's not really talking about, you know, technological innovation, which is what progress studies talks more about. He's talking about these myths like social justice activism or um, the intellectual dark web or whatever. 
and these are myths that are these and we can differentiate these later but the the crucial myths are one that coordinate lots of people through these shared collective orders these are these are often called institutions uh, the classic ones are religions and companies um, but there's also like these online movements like you know social justice activism or black lives matter or you know maga and these these movements are powerful because you know something like uh moralizing gods were helpful when they emerged you know thousands of years ago because we were living in cities because we wanted more impersonal trust because they forced uh, they allowed us to do this impersonal trust with each other and that uh yeah and and so that created these new religions that were moralizing gods uh, that said hey you should if you uh, you be good um and then that don't ste cheat on your neighbor you know that's like one of the ten commandments it's like don't kill or, st or steal from your neighbor and also those things emerged over time to get like proselytizing memes um that said hey spread this with people and like if you're not in the a christian like go kill the other people and like let's have the crusades or whatever and so these are all forms of um, so all these things really want to replicate. They're all proselytizing. Um, something like you know Black Lives Matter, Me Too, or MAGA are also proselytizing uh, because they want to. If they're not, then they get outcompeted by something which is. And so these and all of these movements also, as a note, they need to have. They need to also. They need to control attention, but they also need to control capital, right? Because these are like organisms that want to perpetuate themselves. And, um, and so the church did it by uh, taking these old kin-based structures and saying, no, 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 um, instead give your money to us through bequests uh, and give your land to us. And they went from owning, you know, 5% of land to 33% of land uh, in a very short period of time um, in, in the 1500s. Uh, and that was because everybody was like, oh, man, I don't want to go to hell. I want to give church my land. And the church was able to perpetuate itself as a result of having this money. This is where things like tithing and zakat and dana, um, th that's where they all come up is through this uh, need for the religion itself to sustain. And it's also why things like companies work because companies are – profit is their way that they sustain. Um, they need that kind of money, that fuel of money. Um, and so <laughs> all coming back to this cultural change equivalent of progress studies, he's talking about these myths and why they um, – and how they, you know, uh, the ba how they battle versus each other and things like that. And I think that I would even claim that he's even saying a smaller form of that, which is like, he, these are myths that are, he's not talking about companies, um, but I think he kind of should be because all these myths kind of compete against each other and they all have different niches in the kind of information ecosystem, uh, but they are all part of this myth kind of you know meta meme species so this is to say i think as we start to answer this question what is the cultural change equivalent we need to ask what information wants and one of the things that we can look at is and he does it here to some extent it's like looks at a couple of these different groups but i think it's helpful you know i wrote this piece a long time ago based off of that peter Lindbergh piece in mimetic tribes and here's like you know peter Lindbergh in his piece gave a lot of different mimetic tribes but you can see this graph here of like here are some of the tribes that exist um you have the establishment left you have the establishment right you have you know on the left you have folks that are into identity these are social justice activists black lives matter me too you also have the class-based left which are like you know occupy and antifa and whatever and then you have the right and then you have you know identity-based right which are like the manosphere and whatever and also the class-based right which is stuff like you know QAnon and stuff like that um, and then you also have these like metagamers up top, like uh, rationalists or post-rationalists or what have you, um, the uh, sense-making web. Um, and so I think that understanding these different, uh, you can start to map these groups like this, this, and this is just one mapping that I made, which I think is moderately helpful. There's also, you know, a, a book that I read recently or recently-ish and then prepared for a podcast for it called Strange Rights by uh, is Tara Isabella Burton. And this one talks about as religion is going down and in America, you know, 47% of 
we just hit a non-majority of people that go to an organized church or mosque or synagogue every week or every month. Uh, so that's 47%. And so as that decreases, these new kind of intuitional, individualistic, kind of networked individualism uh, religions are popping up. You can call them religions. You can call them places to find meaning, whatever. And, you know, for her, she talks about kind of... Th she talks about a couple of big ones, but her biggest ones are, she talks about social justice activism, which is, you know, true and is a very clear, uh, you know, new religious-like thing that provides people a lot of meaning and community. Um, and, uh, you know, as an example of that, you know, 75% uh, of folks who are, uh, yes, yeah, 75% of social justice activists consider politics a hobby, while the normal population is like 25%. Or something. Um, in any case, there's the SJAs. There's also, you know, for her, she talks about, you know, the traditional uh, backlash or, or the traditional other side there would be, you know, the right, the alt right, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, she calls them atavists. And these are atavists just means like thinking in the past. So social justice activists are more often being like what about the future like let's change the future and atavists are like let's return let's make america great again let's like go to the past and so those are two of her main kinds of um groups and then she adds a third one and this is where it kind of breaks from the uh you know both my my graph here of you know these cultural groups and also breaks from I think the um, Scott Alexander's piece, which mostly talks about social justice and kind of the right, um, and this, and she talks about. So Tara says, "Hey, there's also this thing called um, there's also the techno utopians," uh, and I think that that is a pretty crucial piece here. And it's also interesting that in you know Scott's piece that he doesn't you know he's part of the techno utopians and part of like the the rationalist community, um, and so I think that there's. And this just gets into these questions of like, who do we count as new religions or not? And how, what is their kind of underlying value generator function? Are they controlling attention like social justice is? Or are they controlling money um, like something like the techno utopians are? So this is a big way of saying we do need to understand the cultural change equivalent of progress studies more. Um, and I think the way we do it is by starting to ask questions about what information wants and going from there. Okay, beautiful. Uh, yeah, let's chat about. Oh, and let me say let me say one other piece here, actually, which I do think is crucial. As we think about replicators, and let me actually double check one thing here, which is like, is does anybody checking on my thing? Okay, no one's checking. Good. Um, uh, if anybody, so let's go back to this piece. So. The when we think about what information wants, that information is is really composed of three forms. There are genes, memes, and bits. And we kind of understand genes the best. Genes, we know what genes want. They work by creating these vehicles, aka bodies, aka protein, you know, synthesizing proteins, and then using those proteins to then replicate and reproduce. That is how genes kind of replicate. And we know that with that form, we can we can think about, okay, which genes are actually going to replicate here? And it's a little bit more complicated than this, but not that much more. The genes that will replicate are roughly equal to the environment that exists. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, for a couple billion years, there's what you know geologists call the boring billion, which was from 1.8 to 0.8 billion years ago. And that was when we, even though we had multicellularity, even though we had sexual reproduction, uh, we had all the tools to make cool humans and all the Cambrian explosion stuff. We didn't do it because the genes there, they were trying to do it, they were trying to do it, but they couldn't. Um, and it's because the environment wasn't fit for them. There wasn't enough oxygen yet. It was just like a sulfury, nitrogeny world, um, and there was, you know, the, the the ozone layer didn't exist, so you couldn't go on land and all this crap. And so, yeah, the the genes that existed um, were like, okay, well, was, well, what's the environment? Oh, it's kind of a crappy environment. Great, we're just gonna hang out in the ocean for a long time. 
And then once the environment changed, once we got a, um, we had an ice age, the ice age ended, the ozone layer was formed, and then oxygen filled the atmosphere. And what that allowed for was this Cambrian explosion of animals and plants. That's when plants and animals started, you know, 550 million years ago. And so that is, those things are essentially a response. And that's when eyes form. That's when all these amazing things happen. And that is, it's, it's all just thing of you have this informational substrate that contains the genes. And then those genes are trying to say, what can I live? Can I live here? Can I reproduce here? Can I reproduce here? And eventually they're going to iterate, 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 and then solve a design problem, which is how do I live in this environment? Um, and so, and I, I state all this because there's one way to ask the question of what information wants. And there's one way to say like, oh, we need to change the information, you know, like, oh, there's like, there's bad, there's fake news all over the place. And so we need like, you know, get rid of it. And I would push back on that because I think that what we actually want to do when we think about memes and we think about their own ability to replicate, they're going to replicate, they're going to replicate, but which ones are going to win? The ones that are going to win are going to be the ones that are fit for the environment. And so we essentially need to change the environment such that the genes that successfully replicate it are ones that are good for us. I'll say that one more time. The way to create a positive future, roughly, is to create an information environment and ecosystem where the memes that can that succeed in it, that can replicate and get energy within it, are the ones are 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 the ones, the memes that will succeed will fill the niches created by a designed environment that we have designed that will be positive for us. So that's that's the rough idea. And, and what it means is it means that we should, we should, we need to think about where memes live and, and are the homes, essentially. Where, where can memes live? And these are things like you know, our brains and how can we make good, like, you know, it's a classic thing of like hurt people, hurt people, or like, you know, people that end up getting into QAnon or whatever, you know, or go to stop the steal, they are, um, they believe in the great replacement theory because, you know, they are naturally conservative because their big five scores are lower on openness to experience and they're worried about the great, great replacement and there's more, you know, immigrants moving into their neighborhood and so they're scared and blah, blah. And so if you, if we can solve all of those things, then when a something like stop the steal eventually emerges and tries to live in their mind <laughs> their mind says nah i'm good i already have my needs met in these ways and this meme isn't welcome here so we need to do it for brains we need to do it for our information environment itself so this is the idea behind, uh, you know, Rene de Reista's mediating consent and the idea of friction, you know, free reach versus free speech. We need to make it the case that the memes that can spread, you know, hashtags or, you know, when Trump says, blah, 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 this, you know, the, the election was stolen or whatever, that that kind of thing, although it would, quote, unquote, naturally spread if we didn't add friction to it, we add friction to it because we want to create an environment where those things don't as easily spread. We're creating mimetic immunity, both within our brains and within the code itself. Yeah. So I think, I think that this is just, you know, as we develop this cultural change equivalent of progress studies, it's really a question of what information wants, and it is really a, and, and we do need to understand what information wants. And we also need to understand like the, the solves, the things to make a better future are designing environments such that replicating information that, you know, information that wants to replicate f goes into niches that we'd like. Okay. So that is that piece. Um, 
let's chat about this next big thing, which is some books that I've been reading recently. And, you know, you know, I was going to talk a little bit about Strange Rights, but I already did. Uh, the other one that I want to kind of mention here is Brains. Uh, the books on brains, man. Um, <laughs> these are, and let's see what kind of stuff we got here. Um, yeah, so here's the idea behind the brain stuff. As I said before, we need to understand our brains to understand what memes can live in them. And I don't really understand brains very well. They're very complicated. And so I'm trying to understand brains well, and so I'm interviewing folks on my podcast to understand brains better. A simple example of brains, of, of things that can live in brains and how information lives in brains is with short-term memory. So this is this piece that I wrote recently called Media Message Fit. And this is from, this is kind of combining two ideas. This is the idea of product market fit, where you have something like uh, Uber and it found product market fit because you had a bunch of people that had a need to move around and transport you know, and you create a product uh, that, that was fit for that market and boom, it, you know, they shot off and there was lots of growth. I was just now talking about gene environment fit where a gene is fit for an environment. And we can also think about kind of meme brain fit where a meme is fit for the brain or, and these are all a, the meta form here is, you know, medium message fit, right? Where you have a, you want uh you have some kind of uh, environment, aka the medium, you know, whether it's brain or the internet or whatever, and you want a message, certain messages are, are fit for that medium. Uh, and this is, you know, Mark McLuhan's, the medium is the message. That's what he's saying here. He's saying the environment determines the information that can live with on it. So with that peace in mind, we can think about memory. And, um, you know, the informational substrate of our brain and how, how do information lives in there, you know, and short term memory is one of those things. And it is, it's kind of, in some ways, it's kind of simple. There's like, you know, roughly two different homes that it can live in. And there's a picture here that I'm showing to the viewers on YouTube, which is there is our central executive, which kind of determines what's happening at a given time. But there's our, what they call our visuospatial sketch pad, which is really our mind's eye. And then there's the, our phonological loop, phonological loop, which is our mind's ear. And so that's where things get stored. So when you think about a, uh, and then those things eventually like go into long-term memory and stuff. And there's also this other thing, episodic buffer, which is can like store these like flashbulb memory kind of things. In any case, and then all those three things get put into long-term memory but the easy ones to understand are the you know mind's eye and the mind's ear and you can think of them as these yeah it's just like okay we have a catchy song you we know that catchy music once we start to get this phonological loop it was that start to become a little home for something to live in there what was going to live in there ah catchy songs catchy songs were just fit for that for our mind's ear you know, if I think about catchy songs in my mind right now, dun, 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 you know, that's just, that's, it's a perfect little fit for our loop, uh, for our mind's ear. And so that's an example of trying to understand brains and how understanding brains can help you understand the information that lives in them. And so now I'm interviewing, you know, neuroscientists and, and I'm saying like, oh boy, this is going to be tough. Neuroscientists and, um, you know, philosophers uh, and, and brain philosophers about how the brain works. And so I want to state one of them, you know, part of this book that I read recently called uh, Surfing Uncertainty. So here's the book. It's a beautiful book uh, by Andy Clark. I haven't actually read it, but I've, it's it's long. It's, uh, it's not that long, 416 pages, but I've read some great book reviews of it and have also, um, you know, watched some of his stuff on the internet. And the key book reviews from Slate Star Codex and the idea behind this book is that there's this it, it provides us a crucial model for understanding the brain called predictive processing and predictive processing is um looks like this so there's this little image where you have um these and this is probably too complicated of an image but you essentially have two uh 
how to explain predictive practicing. There is essentially our mind creates all these top-down models of how we expect the world to be. We predict what the world's going to look like. And then we fit bottom-up sensory information into that, into those models. Okay, so that there's just like two parts of <laughs> of brains. There's our top-down, what about this? What about this? I predict this. I predict this. And then there's these bottom-up like, here's what the data actually looks like. Here's what the data actually looks like. And this, it, there's a couple, you know, memes or whatever that, that, that talk, that, that kind of get the crucial idea of predictive processing. One of them is uh, our brain models to fit the world or, or our brain changes input to fit our models and changes our models to fit our input <laughs> what that means is our as input is coming in it we change it to make it align with the models that we have so for example if you show um the word nurse to me a bunch nurse 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 and then show me the word doctor all jumbled up i will find doctor very easily because i was I'm, I'm changing the sensory input to like match the models that I have. But then long term, what our brain tries to do is it changes the models themselves to match the sensory input. So, you know, if we we don't want to like have models of the world that say like, oh, uh, a tiger is eating me all the time, because that just doesn't, that's not happening in my modern life. And so our models of the world will update to be like, no, 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 I, I predict mostly no tiger. <laughs> um so that's the idea, and, and, and the key thing that the brain is minimizing for, it's kind of like optimization metric, which is actually pretty similar to like AI's optimization metric, is uh, surpri minimizing surprisal, aka minimizing the difference between what the model predicted and what the world actually, what the sensory data actually was. Um, and so as an example, here's this like great image that I'm showing the YouTube viewers now of you know these two images on the left and the right. And you look at those, you're like, what the hell is that? I can't tell. It's just these like black and white dots. But once I tell you that the one on the left is a Dalmatian and that the one on the right is a cow, then I've essentially changed your model, your top-down model to say Dalmatian and cow. And now the sensory input that's coming in can automatically connect that to the correct model. I can be like, oh my God, that is a Dalmatian. I now see the sensory input as a dog. And now I see the sensory input on the right as a cow. And so there are lots of examples of this. You know, the like, um, uh, you know, the I love, there's a classic triangle of I love Paris in the the springtime. It has two thes in it, but mostly we don't look at both of those thes because our, even though the sensory data is giving us two thes, our top down model is like, okay, the second the is just, uh, we don't need it. It's bonus, you know? <laughs> um, and so our top-down models are just saying, ignore that. So this is just a very helpful way to... Hi, there's a little cat outside my door. Um, hi, bud. Okay, you can come in here. Uh, so this is a helpful way to understand how our brains work. And I think that when we think about it from the context of what information wants and creating a healthy information environment for memes... Um, I think that for me, my primary kind of, you know, answer here is that, yeah, we're trying to create, yeah, the, essentially that our, the frames, our top-down models are very, very important, and that we should essentially create a world where we have what I would call like top-down model design or something like that, which is um, where we're aware of how we create these top-down predictive processing models, and we actively, intentionally engage in the awareness and creation of them for everybody because then the information that uh the information that we take as input from the world gets you know fit into those models um sorry i'm just looking at my little cat here so cute um hi shadow uh <laughs> so that is kind of an example of how i'm thinking about this i'm not sure if it's right or wrong but i think it is i think it's directionally correct to say that we need to understand brains to understand homes that memes live in and this predictive processing model shows us a path forward a design path forward to create positive um uh top-down models for 
it, yeah, it's essentially like, you know, psychology and stuff like that to help people understand their biases and to create um, better places for memes to live. The other thing I want to state here is that, um, as I kind of noted earlier, or, or let me see another thing here, which is, you know, I'm, there's this one model, and this is from a kind of a philosopher type. And then the other interview I'm doing soon is with a uh, a woman who just wrote this really good book. If you look at um, science published in the year 2021, a lot of them are about uh, brain stuff, especially number two, which is a thousand brains, a new theory of intelligence, um, which is roughly, by the way, it's pretty aligned with predictive processing. It says that essentially our brain creates a bunch of these models of the world, and then they kind of vote with each other to determine the answer. Um yeah, which is very, very similar to predictive processing, as far as I can tell. Again, knowing not that much. Um, this other one, though, Models of the Mind, How Physics, Engineering, and Mathematics Have Shaped Our Understanding of the Brain. And so this is written by a, you know, neuro, computational neuro, neuroscientist, um, uh, Grace Lindsay. And I think that the, the crucial idea here is... <sighs> it's kind of twofold one is you know understanding our mind computationally is very important and two is as we think about our information environment i've mostly been talking about genes and memes but we actually need to understand bits and how uh how bits evolve <laughs> roughly like how the information encoded in zeros and ones how that you know what the not only the tree of life and the tree of ideas but what the tree of algorithms looks like um and so that's why this book is important and as an example of like kind of an important thing to understand it's like okay and i'll show you this on key thing i love on key please use on key please be on keying uh you know this interview if you can on key is a way to take your uh ideas and actually remember them uh, through spaced repetition software and so as an example you know we're talking about back propagation here and this is artificial intelligence understanding how artificial intelligence does computation um and the reason why I bring it up is because, yeah, there is a, mm, what does there say here? Mo, uh, art, our artificial intelligence systems, our AI systems, use backpropagation to determine uh, what they should, to determine neural weights and determine, like, how to make choices hey buddy you want to go back outside okay um and so and they do it through this image here where you can see like oh if you provide it a two um and it initially doesn't see it as a two you know it only gives a 0 0.2 weight here we want to change we want to back propagate and change all the neural weights essentially minimize the surprisal aka you know move down the um take the negative gradient of the cost function <laughs> uh we're trying to you know you know do some stochastic uh, uh hill climbing or you know the reverse of hill climbing um aka minimize surprisal to make it so that when we see twos in the future our neural weights are set up so that we're like oh that's a two um so that's how these ai systems work through this back propagation but we think that our minds don't actually do the same kind of back propagation they have you know 100 billion neurons 85 billion neurons but we think that the back propagation involves every node kind of being able to talk to the other nodes uh while we know in our brains the neurons do not actually um they can't do that uh they can only talk to the ones the, their neighbors and so i say this because understanding even at the neuron level is important for determining how information flows in our environment and how AI does back propagation, but human intelligence and human neurons do not. Cool. That I think is enough said there. TLDR, let me know if you have any thoughts on like how to understand brains better and how to understand them as homes for memes and homes for information. Okay, we're going to attack chat about probably just one final thing today, which is it's something that I've been, you know, kind of rotating around a bit in all of today's discussion, which is this idea of you know, homes and niches for memes to live in. And 
you know, we can think about is like, okay, we know that if you uh, give our brains a phonological loop, then catchy songs will eventually emerge to live in them. And so, too, on the internet, you know that if you create something like Twitter, a charismatic and narcissistic authoritarian like Trump will eventually live on it. Until, you know, we, we uh, add friction to make it so that that can't exist as much. And so, the issue right now is in our information environment, we only have, <laughs> everything is optimized or is like uh, framed around the feed and everything gets collapsed into the feed. And so Wikipedia and random memes and everything just gets like, it gets put into the feed, you know, and, the, and then you compete against each other in the feed. <laughs> and that's dumb. That's really dumb. We need to, and I, I, I love the metaphor of digital public spaces from uh, Talia Stroud and Eli Pariser and Ethan Zuckerman. Um, and these digital public spaces, you know, just like in our real world, we don't just say, okay, everything's just a market for everything. And like, you can, no, we say like, no, there's going to be a library here. This is going to be good. This is going to be a, you know, a space where people can come together and for the community and blah, blah. And similarly, we should have spaces in our information ecosystem that are quote unquote, for the public, <laughs> or at least we should more intentionally design our UX layer on top of things such as just not a feed all the time. And we should be creating spaces that allow, you know, and, and annotation layers and things like that, that allow for different homes for, in, for information to live. And as an example of this, I just want to share this tweet, a little tweet action uh, from AOC. And, you know, after, you know, Biden, so this tweet says, let's do insulin next. And it's a, a retweet of all the vaccine companies, Pfizer, Biotech, Moderna, etc. Their stocks going down after the U.S. says, eh, let's not have patent protections for these COVID vaccines. And I get the idea here, which is like, look, we want to vaccinate the world. And so, and generally, like, oh, why would we have IP? Like, IP is such a, ugh, I hate IP. I hate intellectual property, personally. Especially, like, you know, copyright, artistic stuff. Um, and some of the science stuff, though, it's like, it's more confusing. Um, and so the sad thing, though, is that this, this, you know, uh, meme from AOC, she's so good at this. She, I mean, but, and, and she's, so it's got 42,000 retweets, you know, 280,000 likes. And, she, and when people retweet this, or when people either are pro or con it, there's nothing here that actually says whether it was a good or bad thing to take away the IP uh, protections, the patent protections for these companies. Again, it, maybe it was good, maybe it was bad, but there's nothing here that says any of that. It doesn't provide any additional context. It's kind of like how YouTube videos used to say, hey, here's a flat earth video without linking to the Wikipedia that says, look, flat earth, you know, the earth is round, by the way. Um, and so and I don't mean to totally equate those two things, but but it's 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 a claim. And to some extent, a, but it's a falsifiable. We should be wary of what is a falsifiable, non falsifiable claim. And it's a claim without context, you know, and it's a attention it's a thing that will live in an information environment and succeed in an information environment that doesn't have the requisite context. And so what I want is just for there just to be, just like we sometimes link to Wikipedia pages, there should just be a Kialo for stuff like this. And I just, I made one. Um, Kialo is a great site where you can show pros and cons for various debates. And, you know, I just wrote this one up because there's a lots of good... Um, there's a lot of good things to say, is this good or is this bad? You know, uh, on the good side, it's like, yeah, we want to make it free so that, you know, we just really want to, you know, vaccinate the world. On the bad side, it's like, no, the more important thing is to do technology transfer because um, it's like really hard to make these vaccines. And so like we should just put all our time, energy and effort on that instead. Um, that's the rough pro con. 
but it would just be so nice. So I just started to create this one and here's some pros, here's some cons. And then some other folks, two other folks have been like adding to it or whatever. And, you know, you can see here's like the little graph of, um, of it, you know, and here's, oh, here's the pros, here's the cons. Here's like the specific articles that I was pulling from that are a bunch of these pro cons. But I think, and again, these articles are good with the pro con, but we, what we want is kind of a visualized pro con form near the, um, AOC tweet that says, hey, learn more about vaccine IP protection. You know, here's, you know, 67% of uh, epidemiologists think it's good. 42% of economists think it's good. And here are this, here's the rough pro con for it. That should be included next to a tweet like this. Instead of, you know, one of the top replies being some random ass like, meme thing from the past it's like no 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 so those are examples of some of just the ridiculously low-hanging fruit uh that we need to solve like we have like linking to wikipedia like back and forth like here's the wikipedia page for it like intellectual property here's any like here's the wikipedia page for the deployment of the COVID-19 vaccines and here's people going here's the wiki folks with let's call it you know 10 paragraphs on pros and cons of, of this debate. Um, and so we want to take this pro con thing from wiki and add it to, uh, AOC's tweet. And we don't just want to link directly to this page. This is step one is just linking directly to it. And step two is linking to the Kialo, which gives a clearer pro con of that. Okay. Visualizes the, uh, wiki debate as a pro con. That's what we want, and we're so far away from it, but it's an example of how much our information environment could be better, and I'm excited for that future in which more claims are have the kind of Kialo Procon uh, natively attached to them. Okay, so I think that that's roughly uh, what I wanted to say today. I hope that this was helpful. I think that it is, yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll be evaluating it myself as well. And, you know, but please, you know, if you have any feedback, I'd love to hear it. Uh, and, yeah, I'd love to know what other things you'd like me to dive in on. I have a, a big list of stuff that I want to chat about, but would love to get some direction and to also get some feedback on what is helpful for you in learning about what information wants and how to shape our information environment. Uh, better so that we can yeah create beautiful memes and a beautiful environment for those memes to live in <laughs> so that's the deal thanks again for listening today uh hope of sun and i'll see you next time now let's close the live stream and try to do that so i go over here i go over here i'm gonna say stop